All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this is uh, the second of our Virginia Forum and Library of Virginia collaboration to bring you some of our panels that were uh, that were canceled or postponed due to uh, the 2020 Virginia Forum uh, uh, not occurring last year because of the pandemic. Um, if you don't know anything about the Virginia Forum, we invite you to learn some more by going to our Facebook page. Uh, it's just facebook.com backslash Virginia Forum. Uh, the Virginia Forum is an interdisciplinary educational association of persons engaged in the study and interpretation of Virginia history and our normal annual conference. Uh, it welcomes participation from historical professionals in all fields, including scholars, teachers, writers, archivists, museum curators, historic site interpreters, librarians, and others. Um, and on that note, we are very pleased and, and excited to announce uh, or re-announce that um, the 2022 Virginia Forum is on track to be live and in person um, on April 7th, 8th, and 9th of next year, hosted by the Virginia War Memorial in Richmond, uh, who were going to be our hosts for the 2020 forum that did not happen. So we're super excited that they will get to uh, host us uh, after all. Um, and you're joining us now for the second of our, of our series. Uh, and today is going to be uh, speaking their names, crafting tenacity, women in Jamestown and early Virginia. Uh, just a, a brief note that we have two more uh, scheduled panels, um, one for two weeks from now on August 20th, Fighting for Freedom, Black Activism in the Civil War Era, Lower Shenandoah Valley. And, um, and then Friday, September 17th is our last scheduled uh, Virginia Forum Virtual Friday panel, uh, Family Values, Tropes, and the Struggle for LGBTQ plus Equality in Virginia. Uh, we may have additional ones after that, but we will let you know um, if that is the case uh, uh, through our listserv and through the, the LVA um, events page. Um, and you do have to make sure that you register. I know all of you on this call know how to do that because you're here, um, but just make sure that you register for each session um, individually because there are specific Zoom links that you'll get uh, for each one. So you do have to register for each one individually. Um, so without any further ado, let me introduce uh, Kate Gruber, the president of the Virginia Forum, uh, who is also the, the moderator for this session, speaking their names, uh, Crafting Tenacity Women in Jamestown in Early Virginia. Kate, I pass it off to you. Before we start our presentation, we'd like to begin this afternoon um, by acknowledging that the Jamestown Settlement Museum um, is situated on the landscape of the Powhatan Paramount Chiefdom's territory of Senecomica, the land between two waters, within the district of Paspahay. English colonists settled on indigenous land not far from here on Jamestown Island, displacing the Paspahay by 1611. We acknowledge and pay respect to the Virginia Indians past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the diaspora. And with that, in mind, we will uh, begin our time together this morning. What's in a name? What is a name? It's what we're called, but is it who we are? Is your name your identity? For the vast majority of us, we're born and given a name by our parents before we even took our first breaths. We tend to grow in it, we live our lives in it, and we probably take for granted that people simply know our names. And we trust that because our names are known, we will be remembered. For historians, though, sometimes names are all we have to bear witness to a life lived. All that emerges from an old, faded document to testify that once there was a life. Far more often, names are simply forgotten, deemed unimportant. The writers of history have historically been those in power, white, free, European, male, uninterested perhaps in, or maybe even uninformed about the importance of the lived experience of others, mainly women, enslaved, free, or others outside of their scope of view or simply outside of their presence. We often don't see what's right in front of us, but that doesn't mean it's not there. 
But sometimes, for so many different reasons, we lack names. We may instead have numbers, statistics of births or deaths, or sometimes skeletal remains that only after careful study give up their secrets of gender, age, status, economics. Sometimes we have material evidence, the archeological record, loved objects passed down for many years, decorative arts and museum collections the world over. These are the physical remains of a life lived, but can these objects speak? How do we tease out their secrets and to whom did these objects matter? They had names. Can we imagine, should we imagine, a past as inspired by these records, objects, or even silences? What can we gain? What, what, what might we distort? Can we connect with the past by imagining it in our present? And what do we learn by speaking the names of history today? Engaging with all of these questions will be the purpose of our time together this afternoon, as we unravel the threads of history to speak the names of women in early Virginia. In 2017, a group of women, the Persisters, came together to create a special exhibition at Jamestown Settlement. Armed with the determination to tell the little known stories of women in early Virginia, the resulting exhibition, Tenacity, Women in, early, in Jamestown and early Virginia, was named by the Smithsonian Magazine as a must see exhibition, was featured in the Washington Post and even highlighted in the New York Times. The exhibit also won an AASLH Award of Excellence in 2020 and was made even stronger and more successful by the year long calendar of programming that bridged stories of our past with our shared present. Our panel this afternoon then brings together the driving forces behind the development of this exhibition to explore not only how history was crafted in the 17th century, leaving many women out of the documentary record, but how historians, archeologists, and artists must work together to seek women between the lines, to craft engaging and relevant stories for a modern audience, building a more complete narrative of 17th century Virginia. I'm joined today by my distinguished colleagues at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, and collectively, we are part of the Her Sisters, a group who came together with various talents, strengths, and breadth and backgrounds to bring these tenacious women's stories to life. And each one of my colleagues have critical questions that will require your reflection during our time together. Uh, Bly Straub is the senior curator for Jamestown Settlement. When everyone told us that no artifacts existed to tell stories of women in early Virginia, Bly, Bly's research proved everyone wrong and continues to do so <laughs> time and time again. This afternoon, she brings her phenomenal archaeologist's eye to our discussion to help find women in the material record. Bly's presentation reflects on this question, can an object have gender? Nancy Egloff is our historian here at Jamestown. Confronted with the challenge of seemingly limited resources in the documentary record, attesting to a woman's lives here in the colony, Nancy turned those silences into loud roars. Nancy's presentation asks, can we hear women's voices if they did not record their own history? And likewise, can we hear women's voices between the lines of his story? Abigail Schumann is the Foundation's Special Exhibition Program Manager. An actor, director, and playwright, Abigail wove together three tenacious stories into a singular theatrical experience to explore the lives of Pocahontas, Angelo and Ann Burris. And she'll tell us more about her development of the play Mother Tongue, which ponders the question, is it ethical to use artistic license when telling historical stories? We want you to keep these questions in mind as we'll engage with them uh, together throughout the hour. Now, very quickly, um, through the lens of the Tenacity exhibition, I'm just gonna bring you through that exhibition quickly this morning. Um, but our goal um, in engaging with this exhibition is twofold to explore the lives of women in the 17th century through material culture and the documentary record, and importantly, how to tell their stories, not just with accuracy, but with empathy. And we want to encourage you to do the same. So we'll begin by doing a, a quick glimpse into the exhibition that, expired, that inspired this workshop. Um, Tenacity was an, an exhibition that opened on November 10th of 2018 as a legacy project of the 2019 commemoration. And we really had a lofty but pretty important goal to reinsert women's lived experiences into the narrative of early Virginia history and to tell stories with accuracy, empathy, and relevancy. And we spoke those women's names where we could. We gave space for documents and artifacts to speak their own truths about the extraordinary women who lived and endured and tenaciously per uh, persevered in Virginia. 
Um, as you may know, the 2019 uh, American Evolution Project commemorated some, commemorated some important milestones in Virginia history. Um, and we will get into some of those this morning and how they uh, interacted with women's lives here. And then I'll mention that in just under 5,000 square feet, tenacity led visitors on a journey through 17th century Virginia as seen through the eyes of women, again, such as Pocahontas, Ann Burris, and Angelo, all of whom we'll hear more about later this hour, uh, weaving stories of women into the earliest years of Jamestown's founding, reminding visitors that Virginia Indian women inhabited this place long before English colonization, and those same women had critical roles to play once English men arrived and established James Fort. We told stories of harrowing survival of an Atlantic crossing and even shipwreck, as well as how women impacted and were impacted by wars, laws, and gendered cultural expectations in the first century of the English colony. We'll continue our time together um, exploring more of these objects that came together to tell stories of women um, which were all of these objects were critical to the success of the exhibition. Using objects and primary source documents allowed us to bust the myth that women could not be found in records of early Virginia. You just have to know where to look. And in our gallery, evidence of women's lives was everywhere. And we know many of their names. Again, we'll explore these documents further, um, but importantly, our exhibition explored selections from the Farrar papers on loan from Magdalen College at Cambridge. On these pages, clerks recorded the names, ages, talents, skills, and recommendations of 56 English women who ventured to Virginia in 1621 and early 1622, um, we believe of their own volition. The exhibition also brought into view the name of an unwilling immigrant to Virginia, the first recorded African woman in Virginia. Of her life in the colony, we know precious little, but we do know, thanks to the survival of two important documents, her name, Angelo. But for many of the objects in the gallery and the histories we told, we don't have a woman's name to speak. What we wouldn't give to know more about the countless women who lived in early Virginia. They may be nameless or silent in the record, but they matter. Their stories matter. And as proud as we are of our exhibition, if we're to do real justice to the women whose stories we illuminated in our gallery, we have to keep their memories alive. We have to keep breathing life into their stories, letting the objects of their lives tell their own stories, finding women's loud roars even between the lines of a gender-biased documentary record, and imagine them as they were, in our mind's eyes, and above all, to keep speaking their names. I'll now invite my colleague, Bly, to continue our conversation as she explores women in the archaeological record. Thanks, Kate. Um, as Kate has said, um, we had a wonderful team that brought this excellent ex exhibition together. We all had different strengths, and uh, mine was in the material record, material culture. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about the objects. I can't show you very many, but um, we included objects that were made, worn, acquired, used, and even suffered by women in the 17th century. And I brought one example today. Um, this is a, a, a pot that represents Indian women. Um, it is hand coiled, um, shell tempered, and decorated on the exterior with a fabric impression. And if I lift it up, you can see that it has a rounded bottom. That's sort of typical of the pots produced um, in the late woodland and early contact period. Um, now we'll go to my, um, PowerPoint. Um, the historical records hint at the presence of Virginia Indian women in the early English colony, but this is confirmed through the archeological evidence from the side of James Fort, which is the uh, original settlement of the English in 1607. In contexts dating to the cleanup and rebuilding efforts of Lord Delaware in 1610, archeologists have found thousands of shirts of Indian pottery, many of which mend up into nearly complete vessels. Also present in the colonial context are food processing tools, such as nutting stones, like you see here, mortars and pestles. This is important because Indian women made the pottery and prepared the food. Also found in the same context are bone needles and hairpins, 
as well as evidence of shell bead processing. Women made the trade goods in the Powhatan culture. These objects are not found in contexts dating after 1610 and are interpreted as a concerted effort by Paramount Chief Powhatan to incorporate the male only, except for Ann Burris, she was a single woman in the colony at this time, into his polity by using his women to create bonds of friendship. However, in the summer of 1609, numbers of English women and children started arriving, causing the Chief Powhatan to realize that his plan of incorporation would not work. He withdrew his women from the colony and soon thereafter ordered his warriors to lay siege to the fort. This brought on the infamous starving time of 1609-1610 when three or four colonists died. Um, these lead glazed earthenware vessels started showing up in Virginia's um, archaeological context dating post 1620 and comprise the most um, common product of the colony's first potter, Thomas Ward, who arrived in 1619, called milk pans. They were used to separate milk from cream. As Nancy will soon tell you, the appearance of these vessels in the archeological record has a direct correlation with the arrival of large numbers of women in the colony, as well as the focused importation of cattle. To address a condition only experienced by women, we were lucky to have on loan from the Victorian Albert Museum in London, this rare survival of an unfitted jacket that would provide comfortable dress during pregnancy. The informal garment was probably worn over a petticoat and stays with a linen or lace collar with, and cuffs and a decorative coif. Nancy will explain in a bit who it represented in our exhibition. I might um, say at this point that uh, we have no images of our 17th century women except for Pocahontas. So all the women that we use, the um, imagery, were from Dutch genre paintings and portraits. Uh, so that's, as the example shows you here. We were able to borrow this very important piece of furniture from the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. It has a direct association with a Virginia woman, Mary Percy, who arrived in the colony in 1623 as a 10 year old. The cupboard was probably acquired by Mary with her second husband, Thomas Bushrod, passed down in the family. Wills and inventories recorded it as, quote, the old cupboard. Constructed about 1650 of walnut and yellow pine, it is considered by experts to be the earliest known piece of Southern furniture. And it is possible that it was made near Jamestown in James City County. It is a place to display all one's expensive wares, such as Chinese porcelain, gold, silver, and glass vessels. It's a statement that, quote, I have arrived. In the same exhibit case as the cupboard, we were able to display objects discovered through archaeology that relate to Mary's sister, Elizabeth, who was 13 when she arrived with Mary in the colony. Around 1638, when Elizabeth was 28, and after the death of her first husband, she married 56-year-old Governor John Harvey. The Portuguese tin glazed earthenware bowl and the, fluted, uh, the Dutch fluted dish were both found at the site and are the kinds of things that would de be displayed on the court cupboard. Also found was a piece of window pane on which Elizabeth Harvey had scratched her name. For the first time in over 360 years, the two sisters were reunited in tenacity. While women were always a minority in the colony, outnumbered by as much as six to one in the early years, their presence sometimes posed problems to the established order. We see the response to these issues in the punishments enacted by the male-only government as it tries to control women's behavior. English common law held to the doctrine of coveture. The husband and wife were one at law. The husband was legally responsible for his wife's actions. Since women had no legal standing, they often used the only weapon they had, the power of their voices. A uh, downside for the man is that he could be fined for not controlling his wife. To alleviate men from this burden, the General Assembly of Virginia put into law in 1662, 
that women charged with using their brabbling tongues and expressing their opinions to gossip or slander would not necessarily be the responsibility of the husband, but could be punished by a public ducking. This museum object was discovered before research showed that ducking was actually carried out in Virginia and much earlier than the 1662 law. In 1634, a witness to the fourth ducking punishment that was carried out in one summer alone on the eastern shore of Virginia saw one Betsy Tucker strapped into a chair like this and ducked five times at 30 second intervals before the woman repented and was let go. This was meant to publicly humiliate, but unlike witch ducking was not meant to kill. The witness described Betsy's ducking to the governor of Massachusetts and suggested it as a good punishment to curb the, quote, clatter of the scolding tongues of women like the clatter of a mill, seldom ceasing from morning till night. So now we can uh, address any questions or comments that you may have about objects and um, relating them to gender. So our first question to the group was, can an object have gender? And Stephen Scott has mentioned maybe gender, but not sex. So why do you have thoughts on that? Yes, I would probably say that's true. Yeah, gender, but not sex, right? How do you think that plays out maybe in the 17th century versus kind of the moment where we are in our modern, with our modern language? I don't know. Uh, well, I'm thinking about the um, Thomas Thomasina Hall story. Yeah, about how right. you know material culture, how a person is clothed, was meant to I think dictate both gender, you know, and sex, you know, and and uh, and identity in terms of sex. So that's kind of an interesting way of couching this as well. Mm -hmm. A little bit later in the period. Can you say a little bit more about Thomas Thomasina? Yeah, for people who might not know. I'm gonna pivot this over to Nancy, who just wrote um, a blog post. Right, in the early 1620s, an individual came to Virginia um, dressed as a male person and identifying as Thomas. Um, and this person actually, according to records in England, was born um, and identified as a female. They people around that person identified this person as a female, Thomasina. Um, Thomas Thomasina flipped his, her gender, their gender, back and forth dependent upon the need. So when they wanted to join the military, they engendered themselves as a male person and dressed as a male. When they wanted to um, work in the lace industry, they identified as, and dressed as a female. When they wanted to come to Virginia, they identified as a male again. They were brought on charges um, of actually attacking, sexually attacking um, other individuals in the colony, and that's how this person got into uh, Virginia records. Thank you. We have a couple other questions coming in, but I think it's best to move on to our second presenter, which is Nancy, and then we can um, we can talk a little bit more about some of these other great questions about artifacts here after uh, in our uh, Q and A. So. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, our second section focuses on the documentary evidence from the historical record from the primary sources. And our poll question here is, again, can we hear women's voices between the lines of history, even if they are not writing it themselves? Um, by looking through the lens of women in early Virginia, tenacity gave us the opportunity to refocus our vision and take a fresh look at the primary documents we've always used but this time searching specifically for women in them to better understand and explain their lives. But who wrote these documents? Obviously, primarily men. They did not often tell the women's stories. We hope the exhibit would give these women that chance. Instead of his story, it could become her story. Is her story located somewhere between the lines written by these white Englishmen, each of whom recorded his story and had his story to tell? So we start with um, a few of the women Bly alluded to who came around 1609. In that year, the private corporation, the Virginia Company, sent a large fleet of new settlers to Virginia under its second charter from King James I. 
The company recruited 500 people, mostly men, but some women, and sent them off on nine vessels that summer. And in the Atlantic, the fleet encountered a summer hurricane scattering the ships. While one disappeared, seven headed for Jamestown, but the largest, the Sea Venture, carrying all the new leaders, floundered and wrecked on the coral reefs of Bermuda, called the Isle of Devils by the English because of its often stormy weather, loud indigenous birds and treacherous ring of coral reef. Secretary of the colony, William Strachey, told us about the horrible hurricane, how the ship bounced around in the rough waters and crashed into the islands of Bermuda. Imagine being pregnant through such an ordeal, but several women were. Strachey wrote of two who gave birth in Bermuda, and here you see the unfitted jacket that Bly had talked about earlier. By reading between these lines, we see that one of these women who gave birth was the first Mistress Rolfe, wife of John Rolfe. But you literally have to read between the lines because Strachey doesn't even acknowledge the mother of the child. He says it's the child of one John Rolfe. Of course, Rolf is known for introducing tobacco and marrying Pocahontas as her second wife, and we'll be more on her later from Abby. Then the Rolf child died in Bermuda, you can see the bottom quote there, and her mother soon thereafter, but other shipwrecked women survived and got to Virginia that spring. So while these Sea Venture passengers are wintering in Bermuda, the fleet's other seven ships hobbled into Jamestown in late summer of 09 with more people to feed while most of the provisions and all the leadership lay stranded in Bermuda. Joan Pierce and her daughter, also named Joan, arrived on the ship Blessing. You can see them in the left, document on the left. Weirdly, husband William had traveled on that sea venture and was in Bermuda. Who told us this? Who spoke their names? The clerks who recorded the 1625 muster of the inhabitants, a wonderful and invaluable document for us, that was created on orders from the king when he dissolved the Virginia Company in 1624 to control the colony. Because of the dearth of food, deteriorating relations with local Indians and overcrowding in the fort, the population of Jamestown dropped dramatic, dramatically that winter. So while father, William, spent the winter eating hogs, seabirds, and tortoises in Bermuda, Joan and Joan must have suffered at Jamestown, but they survived. The following spring, husband and father arrived to see his tenacious women. You have to read between the lines to realize what they endured. What else can we learn about Mistress Pierce? This is one of the very unusual cases, I think, in which a man recorded a woman as saying something. Joan seems to have returned to England by 1629 when it appears somebody interviewed her and compiled her account into John Smith's general history, which is what, where this is from in the document on the upper right. You can see that Mistress Pierce now returned, saith she had the garden at Jamestown containing three or four acres where she's gathered a hundred bushels of excellent figs, dot, 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 dot. So she is recorded as saying this, but she didn't write. Now, who told us that John Rolfe married as his third wife the daughter here, Joan Pierce, daughter Joan. John Rolfe himself told us in his will on the right, he not only confirmed that William Pierce was his father-in-law, he mentions his wife Joan, their daughter Elizabeth, and his son Thomas, with whom um, he shared with his first, second wife, Rebecca Pocahontas Rolfe. On the left, who told us after Rolfe's death in 1622? that his widow, Joan, married as her second husband, Captain Roger Smith. Again, the muster roll recorder. Note the mention of Elizabeth Rolfe, fourth one down there, aged four, the daughter of John Rolfe and Joan Pierce Rolfe Smith. Are you confused, Jack, about all of these <laughs> documents and their connections? It's amazing, um, these early generations. Who else has connections to the Pierce household? Again, the muster roll recorder listed Esther Ettery, you see on the left there, a maid servant who came on the ship Jonathan, and Angelo, a Negro woman who came on ship Treasurer. On the right, the Virginia Company ship Jonathan is shown as one of a number of ships who arrived, but Jonathan was one of two who brought in 1620 90 young maids to become wives for settlers, and I've circled that. 
See the young maids at the bottom of the document, young, young maids to make wives, 90. It was the first group recruited by the company. The second followed in 1621 and are recorded in the Farrar papers that Kate mentioned. Since Esther here on the left indicated she traveled on Jonathan, she may have come in 1620 for this purpose to marry. But did she? Did her husband die? Had she never married? We don't know. We also don't know the skill sets possessed by these first 90 women who came to be wives specifically. But the women in the 1621 group, again from the Farrar documents, brought a variety of skills and Esther probably did as well. Gervais Markham here in this quote on the left wrote that a complete women's skill set should include dairying, which was one of the many cultural expectations for women at that time. Note the milk pan that I showed earlier corresponding with the arrival of these greater numbers of women. Note the woman milking the cow. Coinciding with the arrival of the larger groups of women, the company started shipping larger numbers of old world livestock to Virginia, including cattle for breeding. And you can see in the document, the muster again in the upper right, that the Pierce household had 20 um, cattle as well as 20 goats, swine, and pigs. Finally, who told us about the arrival of the first recorded Africans in 1619, including the woman Angela? Well, John Rolfe again, this time in his role as secretary of the colony in the upper right, wrote about the famous arrival of the first recorded 20 and odd Negroes brought to Virginia in 1619 on the White Lion. Governor Sir George Yardley and Cape Merchant Abraham Piercy met the ship at Old Point Comfort and exchanged food and supplies for the Africans. Bly has just told us about Mary Piercy Hill Bushrod's court cupboard, and here you see her father, Abraham Piercy's muster on the upper left, listing Mary. Our connection here is that Piercy, her father, and Yardley, the governor, divided most of these early 20 plus, probably about 29, Africans between them and placed them, placed these unfree individuals on their plantations up the James River. The Negro woman Angela arrived several days later on the ship Treasurer. See the next quote there. Rolf says he, along with a Mr. Ewins, and none other than William Pierce, met the ship. Remember how the muster roll recorders told us where Angela lived in 1625? See that down in the lower right? In the household of William Pierce. Historian Martha McCartney recently found in England's High Court of Admiralty records that the treasurer left behind, quote, two or three Negroes before it departed All Point Comfort. One of these most probably was the woman Angela. As a way to honor Angela, we were so humbled and excited for the opportunity to borrow the original 1625 muster in the lower left for the exhibition from the National Archives in the UK in order to be able to speak Angelo's name. I hope this quick overview has shown how we learned about some of these tenacious women, especially those who did not have a voice and how we began to form connections between their lives. Thank you all. Any questions for us in the chat box? Thank you, Nancy. Sure. I'm gonna check our Q&A here. So here's a question. If we, even if we had diaries from these women, would they really tell us anything about who they were? Wasn't it the style of the time in women's diaries to just record the weather and other non-personal info? So Nancy, well, if, if women, well, did women write in this time period? And if so, or if not, <laughs> if so, what did they write? Well, very few did, but they, there are records of them writing more than just um, the weather and that sort of thing. Virginia Farrar is one, she's in England, she doesn't come to Virginia, but her documents um, helping to record the information about Virginia are, 
are quite detailed. So that's one example. Remember, uh, uh, <laughs> Lady Wyatt is a Lady yes, Wyatt. Lady Wyatt talks about conditions on the ship and how terrible it was. Exactly. Like, thank you for remembering. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think they would have told more than just the weather if they had had the opportunity, <laughs> particularly with their grappling time. Yeah, they probably would have what they were grappling right. about too. <laughs> she's writing about like she's frustrated that she doesn't have like her own right. birth, her own right. little you know like oh how dare she? As she was to, promised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I kind of had this book, and maybe for Virginia, but I can tell it's so with Virginia Fry in Virginia. She recorded a lot. No, she, was, she wasn't. There. There. She was not. She, she got the information and, and recorded it. Mm -hmm. um, well, here's a, an interesting question um, from, from James Stewart. Um, hi, James. Um, in the 17th in 17th century England, there were several wealthy women that were part of the upper class that were either widows or had access to their own funds. Do we know if any women invested in either the Roanoke Island or Jamestown settlements? And how do you think the women who stayed in England viewed those who went to Jamestown? So it's a two-parter. Um, we know that we know the answer to the first. We know that women invested in the Virginia Company. Yes, yeah, yes, quite a few. Well, mm -hmm. who Shirley, yes, and Cicely, Cicely, Shirley, yeah, Delaware, Delaware, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the way Lady Delaware, yeah, Lady yes. Delaware. <laughs> I know her as Lady um, Delaware, was an investor, in yeah, the wife of the governor, yes, mm -hmm. we have a portrait of her yes. in yeah. our gallery yeah. at Jamestown, so mm -hmm. James, come visit, you're overdue, <laughs> Um, the second like part of your question, do you think the women who stayed in England, how do you think those women viewed those who went to Jamestown? That's a really interesting question. Outlanders. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would be, I think it would depend on what, who they were and what class they were from. Yeah, Some exactly. of them probably were very jealous. They wish they could have gone back. <laughs> the others were saying, no, horrible stories are coming back from Virginia. Yeah. Um, Really, I want to very quickly go up to uh, to Stephen's question about Angelo being a name for a female enslaved person. Um, Stephen's asking, uh, was that name given to her by the Portuguese? Well, by the time they record her name, right? When you say Nancy, she that's a name that she is calling her own. So maybe this is a sex or gender question again. Yeah. Who, yeah. who knows? Was, maybe she felt. That's been a confusing yeah. issue for us here, yes. But we have chosen to go with Angelo because that's, that's how, how it's it written in those two documents, the only two documents we have, the one I showed you and the one, one written the year before that was the living and the dead following the 1622 Indian War and conflict. So her name was listed as Angelo in those documents. So that's how why we've chosen to go with because we do not know. Um, does we have another question? Uh, this is the name Mistress Hibbins, um, named as a member of the Seed Venture. Does that stand out to why or Nancy? I don't recognize it. It wasn't name. Hibbins, it's close to that. Or Mistress, Mistress, yeah. Horton. Mistress Horton. Mistress Horton, actually, I think, was in my document as a witness to right. the birth of um, Bermuda Rock. I don't know about a Mistress Hibbins. There's a, um, a great resource that we use a lot here uh, by a historian and genealogist named Martha McCartney, who has, um, you guys help me out with the, the full name of the book. It's Virginia Adventure, Immigrants and Adventures, mm -hmm. um, 1607 oh, six, or 1735. Okay, 1635. Um, so um, mm -hmm. we can put up in the chat um, that reference for you. It really is a great. Um, compilation of primary, you know, it's all primary source based. It's biographical um, sketches with all mm -hmm. primary sources right. listed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's and it's um it's in alphabetical order <laughs> um, of the names of hundreds and hundreds of um, um, mostly mostly European uh, immigrants, of course, mm -hmm. because that's who we see in the primary source documents. Mm -hmm. um, so quickly, we are we are going to switch gears. Um, to uh, the colleague, uh, my colleague here on my left, um, who is going to, um, you want to start with your video or your chat? Um, I want to chat a minute and then go to the video. Um, hi, I'm Abigail Schumann. And um, uh, from the beginning, you may recall uh, the question uh, that I want you to consider is, uh, is it ethical to use historical license uh, or rather artistic license when telling historical stories. And I want you to think of that in terms of a museum. 
um, using that artistic license as opposed to Hollywood or, or television or anything like that, because otherwise we'll be here way over our time. But um, if you wanna if you wanna voice your opinion on that in the chat, that would be great. And we'll take a look at that um, in just a minute. But while you're considering the question, my contribution to tenacity actually didn't come until after the exhibit was thoroughly researched, designed, curated, and being installed. But as I became familiar with um, the content of that exhibition, I was moved to create a play and try to capture some of the emotion that I felt um, in, in viewing the exhibition itself, hoping to add another layer of connection and um, understanding to some of the stories. The hardest part in all that was trying to decide what stories to tell, because as, as we've heard, we know nice little things about many women, but none of the women have a complete story. Um, so creating like a biographical narrative about one person uh, was very difficult. And um, so finally, after much discussion and trying to figure out how to, how to get at um, a compelling tale, uh, we settled on three characters, um, Matoka or Pocahontas, the daughter of Powhatan, who was the Supreme Chief of Senate Komaka when the uh, English arrived. And uh, also Anne Burris, who was mentioned earlier as for a while being the only female here. And John Smith writes of her having the first uh, wedding in the English colony when she marries John Layden. And then the third character was Angelo, uh, who we've just heard about um, having arrived here with the original um, first Africans in 1619. And using these three women, it was just the best vehicle to represent the three cultures that converge here. And we knew enough about each of them to feel that there was something to say of substance about them. Um, what I'd like to do right now is just play a real brief clip uh, from the play that's actually from very near the end of the play. But I think it sums up for us the, the interconnectedness that we've been hearing about of, of these three women in particular, who in real life, there's nothing to suggest they ever would have reenacted, interacted with one another in any way. But it also will open up my take on the artistic license question. So if we could play that, please, Kate. Intertwined. So in life, time and circumstance separate us. We brush up against one another in surprising ways. Captain John Smith wrote, there was a marriage between John Layton and Anne Burris, which was the first marriage that we had in Virginia. That's my English brother witnessed your marriage to John Layton and made notice it. And Matoka's husband, Rebecca, Rebecca's husband, returned to Virginia, to Senecomica, to the land of her father, he left your son in the care of his English relation. And when John Roth returned to Virginia, he married again to Jane Pierce, the daughter of William Pierce, Angelo's master. Our lives are woven together like threads in a tapestry, each strand the color of a different land, each strength vibrant and strong, each connected, each part of a bigger story. Okay, um, some amusing uh, auto closed captions there. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Uh, but um, the, the connections that um, the women are speaking about in this clip are, are all real connections. Um, and you heard you heard some of it earlier from from Nancy about. Um, uh, uh, Matoka being the wife of John uh, Rolfe, who then marries Joan Pierce, who is the, um, the master or the enslaver of Angelo. So those kind of connections weren't something I was thinking about when I, when I began uh, writing the show. And so for me, as I, you know, 
pulled more and more information from uh, from our historians, I I was able to discover this, and that was that was kind of neat. And I hope that people who saw the play were able to discover it in the same way because it was really kind of an emotional moment. And I think that you know there, as I said before, there's no reason to believe any of these women ever. Um, knew of each other or interacted in real life. In fact, um, Matoka is dead by the time Angelo arrives in Virginia, and she died um, in England and was and was buried in England. And that's another emotional connection that I felt with the characters was just the realization that they were each born in one land and traveled across an ocean to another land were taken across an ocean, really in all three cases. Um, and then they died and were buried in these foreign lands. Um, you know, that's, that was very moving to me and, and gave the women something in common. I don't know if anybody responded to the mm -hmm. question about artistic license to get an idea of, um, of what people were thinking about that. Yeah, we um, we have, I think everyone is overwhelmingly um, in favor <laughs> of yes. taking some artistic license. Um, uh, Amanda Powell says, um, uh, well, I think this might be, this actually feels right for um, the art, you know, drawing stories out of the, the material culture record and also um, the, the documentary record um, to, to base things on contemporary accounts, to create these narratives, to fill in the holes, because this is how we create relatable stories um, that, uh, that visitors, that uh, the general public uh, can really learn from um, and, and feel connected to. Um, Stephen, thank you for your support. He thinks this is great. Mm -hmm. um, just as long as you make clear that we've used our knowledge of the period to fill in some of the gaps. And I think if you um, have seen um, Abby's, um, Abigail's full play, um, she makes that very clear. Can you say a little bit about how you um, you address this idea of, I don't know what happened. We don't know, historians don't know what happened, but here's what might have happened. And I think that, and that's the perfect segue to my closing. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that um, what I was able to do and what, what I finally settled on in order to bring these three women together, I'm looking up there, I should be looking here, uh, that, that never would have come together was created um, a non-historical place for them to be. Uh, and a, we created that just by having them questioning, where are we? Why have we three come together? And the basic description that was in the poster um, for the program uh, sort of sums it up and allowed us to have that sort of license that was necessary to create a, an ongoing narrative. And that was that three women of early Virginia come together in a timeless space to consider if and how they will be remembered and if it matters. And that to me was my way of taking the beautiful work that my colleagues did in creating the Tenacity exhibition and just framing it in another way. Yes, we need to remember them. And yes, it truly does matter. So, um, the artistic license that was allowed by having them in a non-historical place broke down any barriers of social convention or language barriers or mother tongue barriers and allowed them to just speak as, as we speak amongst ourselves um, and have interactions that were based in, as I believe somebody mentioned there, um, in the chat bar that, that are based in our contemporary understanding of the world and of human nature, because that's something that never changes. I mean, our DNA um, continues. And although the trappings of our lives change, um, that doesn't. And I think that's the way into history is to connect with people there. And so what questions do we have? <laughs> <laughs> that concludes the formal part of our presentation this morning. Um, I'd love to keep seeing more questions come in um, in the chat box or in the Q&A. Um, and thank you so much to our friends and colleagues at the Library of Virginia for helping to moderate um, the chat and Q&A as well. Um, I want to go back to a couple questions that I saw um, at the very beginning of our time uh, together that, that I want to make sure we have a chance to, uh, 
to talk about. Um, going back to Bly's presentation about, uh, about objects and artifacts, is that a real ducking chair? Yes, as a matter of fact, it is. Um, and it is in the collection of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, hopefully soon to be on display in our permanent gallery. Yes. Right here at Jamestown. You want to say a little bit more uh, quickly about the object itself and, and why, how and why it's in? Um, it came to us um, circuitously, but originally from England. It was in England. We do not know its exact age because ducking uh, was actually practiced quite late um, in England into the 19th century. Um, and there are a few ducking chairs sort of in odd places <laughs> if you visit over there, like in uh, churches of all things. <laughs> and um, this one was had been acquired by a gentleman and he had had it out in his garden. <laughs> um, but so we say we don't know its exact date, but it is representative, as you saw from the illustration I showed, of the type of um, chair that a woman would be um, strapped into. Um, the artifacts, so um, Sherry Guerta says, um, the artifacts suggest design by men to control women's functions, um, which in many cases is absolutely true, the definite chair, of course, but um, were there items that showed female ingenuity in their own circumstances? Um, the first thing that I thought about was actually a bodkin. Yeah, um, the bodkins? Yeah. But well, they would be made by men. True. I guess I was thinking uh, of the... Unless it's the uh, Indian women, so... Oh, um, needles. I mean, a lot of the, you know, Indian women were making their own tools and so forth, but, and, and one, actually one needle we found, the, the needles were used to make their baskets and mats, to weave them together, and they were so finely wrought that the English say they stole them every chance they could if they couldn't purchase them, but one of the needles we found actually had a very decorative design uh, scratched onto it, so a very personal item for Indian women. Um, I do want to make sure that the uh, <laughs> that everyone hears the question, will there be a book compiling all this information because some people have missed this wonderful exhibition? Um, we are trying so hard. <laughs> yeah, there really should be one. Um, <laughs> so if you, feel, if you feel like, uh, you know, saying that louder um, yes. and <laughs> uh, to the powers that be, we are, we are really yes. hoping to work on that. Um, but, uh, but what books do we recommend to find out more about the topic of, of maybe not just women in early Virginia, but, but how we do what we do um, in terms of making this information accessible, how kind of digging in, like literally digging in um, uh, into the history. Any favorite books? We've mentioned Martha McCartney's uh, Immigrants and Adventurers book, which is great. But what else would you recommend on this topic? Catherine Brown's book, what was? Oh, mm -hmm. Kathy Brown. Mm -hmm. um, which, oh gosh, which one? Um, uh, Anxious Patriarchs. <laughs> I didn't come with the And then for my part, it's some um, archaeological reports. I mean, a lot of what we're learning new is coming out of the ground. So, and unfortunately, a lot of it is in gray literature, so not necessarily published. Books. And well, Terry Snyder, um, Bradley Women. Yeah, that was Bradley Women. One resource that I did not discuss, but we didn't really um, a touch on a whole lot of things, are the um, minutes of the Virginia Council and General Court, which actually do include testimonies by women, um, the most famous one being Isabel Perry, who seems to be called on all the time to testify. The type of a woman Isabel Perry might have been, we don't know, but but that's a source that does have women's names. Men recorded it all. Men recorded their testimonies as a court court would, but um, there are women's names in the court cases. Oh, what's a bot? Oh, thank you for that. And um, I think what we can do, and we'll work with uh, with Stephen as well, is uh, maybe uh, write up a bibliography of primary and sure. secondary sources and make that mm -hmm. available um, on the New Virginia Forum blog, which is called Footnotes, which I will plug, um, and maybe uh, Stephen and others can kind of plug that um, on the chat as well. Um, we did have a, a quick question going back. What's a bodkin? I just threw that word out there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, it's a tool that women would use uh, because their clothing is laced together. So um, it's a, a long pointed um, object. It can be silver or it can be base metal and sometimes mm -hmm. even bone. 
and there'd be a little slot for the lace to fit in. And um, typically they'd stick it in their hair so as not to, you know, under their cap, under their clock, so as not to lose it. And you see a lot of Dutch paintings illustrating that. Some are personalized. And actually there is a theory that was put forth that perhaps they were given as gifts to women who had just given birth because they, if you're nursing a child, you need to lace and unlace your bodice quite often. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've got time for, for about one more, um, one more question. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop that over um, to Abigail. Um, Kevin has a, a thought about, um, I think how, how an audience, Kevin, I wanna make sure I get your question right. Um, if we are creating this like historical drama based off of primary sources, but based off of maybe primary source inspired conjecture, how do we, how do we like take it from the audience's perspective? He says, how do we document our judgments to our quote unquote readers? So to the audience viewing um, the performance, I'm assuming is what you mean, Kevin, um, who aren't going to read the script, but who will watch the performance? What's the equivalent of the footnote in a play or performed media? Um, I'm curious about how you feel about that. Um, no, I think that's an excellent question. And it's something that I consider when writing um, uh, historical dramas all the time. Um, I mean, obviously, first you have to investigate all of those sources as thoroughly as you can to make sure that you're solidly grounded in historical fact. Um, and then you need to, you know, move out from the primary sources to your secondary sources. I mean, we all know this. And then you get the contexts of the world so that you can fill in the blanks. Um, and I mean, true, that's stuff that hopefully is going on in the creation and how do you convey it? I was so lucky with Mother Tongue because of this otherworldly place. There are points throughout the play where the women actually go, I don't know how I know this. Um, but I do in this space, or they say, history says this, or history doesn't answer that question for me. And so that was a liberty that most plays don't have. So it's a very interesting question of how to footnote it. Um, you know, do you have it in the credit roll at the end? Uh, well, I guess that that's if it's made into a video, or do you have a talk back after a performance? And I think perhaps that would be um, the best way to address those kind of questions when you're dealing with um, potentially controversial um, historical matter or interpretations so that you can actually have a conversation with the audience at the end about why certain choices were made and how they were inspired. But grounding it all in fact is the key, I think. Hey, could I also put a plug in for the Library of Virginia? That we rather new two volumes set on Virginia women. That Absolutely. Virginia, you know, that, um, and the Treasury was involved with, and so forth. But, you know, we don't want to, want to. We don't want to be doing this and not mention that. It's a, it's a great new source. We will be sure to put yeah the, dollars. Yeah, two two new volumes from the Library mm -hmm. of Virginia on this mm -hmm. topic that we'll be sure to put our bibliography. Um, well, I see so many more ch uh, questions coming in and comments, but we are out of time. Stephen, I don't know if you want to hop back in or anything, but um, just from us at JYF, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to present something that is very much near and dear to our hearts and will continue to be for, um, for uh, Jamestown Settlement. And please come visit us at the museum. And um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Yeah, and I'll just say that you know we we were, we're planning to do some blog posts um, on the the forum website as you as you mentioned and and maybe you know I think we'll capture this chat and be able to kind of you know maybe we'll answer some of the questions there uh, as, as well. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.